card game. Uh, I had no idea how big this game was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I started working on it. I'm glad that I didn't. I probably would have been a little more nervous. Um, I've said we've been working on this game, the rebirth of this game, for the last couple of years. Um, I'm really, really happy with the results uh, from the art, graphic design, game design itself is a lot of fun. The team did amazing work. And uh, I'd like to uh, play a video for you now of that team. Legend of the Five Rings is a collectible card game that debuted in the mid to late 90s um, during that era when collectible card games was really at its peak and an incredible amount of lore and memories and gameplay have really been added to it by um, the creators and the fan base and have turned it into this beloved property that we have today. And now we're gonna take it into the next chapter. So Legend of the Five Rings is one of the oldest CCGs out there debuted in mid-90s at Gen Con um, to a huge turn of a lot of excitement because this card game brought a new element. It allowed fans to have interaction with the ongoing storyline. As a setting, it's based in the world of Rokugan, which is a fantasy setting that is based on Japanese, some Chinese elements, Mongolian, a lot of East Asian um, cultures. The IP is also from the card game. It's developed a lot of fiction, RPG, uh, miniatures games, some board games, so it's kind of blossomed into a lot of different ways for people to tap into the world. The curtain opens on an empire in turmoil. The seven great clans are each in a weakened position. The crane, who are normally known for their wealth and their influence, have been hit by a massive tsunami that has affected their stores of rice and their wealth. Um, they are suffering from decreased influence in the courts, which has allowed the Scorpion to ascend in their place. And as the Scorpion come into ascendancy, that leaves the entire political landscape in turmoil and instability. And then, of course, we also have militarily border skirmishes breaking out between the clans, and threats are coming from beyond the wall from the Shadowlands now to threaten the Crab and possibly all of Rukugan and beyond. So the most important things that we brought forward from the TCG are, of course, the clans. The other thing that we brought forward is a lot of the structure of how conflicts work. We want players to have this back and forth fight over the provinces that they're trying to break. Players are going to have the chance to represent their clans. They're going to have a chance to steer the storyline um, in a direction that they believe will be compelling. So we're going to be having um, a story told both through the cards and through the, the fiction that comes in those card packs. When you play the game, you're, you're representing one of the great clans of Rogue so you pick the one that you want to play the most. What I'm going to be trying to do is go into my opponent's territory and take over their provinces, and there are two different ways to do this. One is by military attacks, one is by political attacks. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about kind of when you're invading your opponent's area, you don't know exactly what you're going to find when you get there. So basically, the players are going to be trying to break, you have to break three out of four front row provinces before you can get at the stronghold, and then the first player to break the opponent's stronghold will win the game. So ever since I first encountered Legend of the Five Rings back in 2010, it quickly became my, my favorite setting, both to role play in, to read, um, to write in. And as someone who now gets to work on the setting with Fantasy Flight Games, it's been a dream come true. I'm really excited to be able to share these stories with you now at the Gen Con release. So yesterday, we had our uh, inaugural or the Legend of the Five Rings tournament, uh, Kiki Matsuri. It was amazing. I don't know if any of was anybody here at, at, at that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. It was great. I, it's it, over 700 people at the tournament. It's the largest tournament that, that we've ever had by, by far. Uh, and then, you know, just hearing everybody chanting <laughs> simultaneously. Uh, very loud, probably disrupting everybody else in the event hall. Uh, it was it was amazing, and it, it, it really like drove home to me like how important this game and uh, the world of Rokugan is to so many fans. Uh, so as Katrina mentioned in the video, uh, 
we're carrying the torch uh, with this game as, a, as in the original CCG, where fans will be able to interact with the story, influence the story through our major tournaments and decisions they make at those tournaments and the results of those tournaments. So we have the first result from the tournaments yesterday. Uh, the Emperor's Favor at Winter Court. Winter Court is going to be at our, uh, our World Championship event in November. And what that means is the clan uh, who won the Emperor's Favor, the, uh, uh, our event space will be decked out in their colors and heraldry. So the winner of that was the Dragon Club. Steve, I see you're very happy with this. <laughs> Uh, so the, uh, the second thing that, that was determined uh, yesterday uh, was a uh, story point that I think if you were following it on our website and reading any of our fiction leading up to release, uh, the, uh, the, the Phoenix Clan is uh, practicing a very controversial, dangerous magic, unicorn. name magic using like two unicorn. names. Unicorn. Oh, unicorn, sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I'm learning, I'm learning. I'm getting there. Uh, so it's a, it a question of whether they'd be allowed to uh, to continue using that magic or not, and the answer is this. Yep. You told me Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going to be able to continue to use the uh, <laughs> continue to use magic uh, as they've been practicing it. So we'll see what happens. I, I'm imagining that horrible things will happen. I don't know if you read that story, but it didn't look like anything good was going to come from any of those repetitions. Uh, so, uh, speaking of uh, speaking of card games, oh yeah, it's a jangle. Oh yeah, that's right. I'm sorry, I forgot. There's uh, something I needed to mention that didn't get mentioned earlier that we were hoping to mention is that we have uh, the game available at the show. Uh, I think there's other copies left. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so if anyone uh, wanted a copy and didn't get a chance to get one, uh, you won't have to wait that long. It'll be available for wide release uh, on October 5th. Uh, Alright, now, now the segue I was, I was getting to. So speaking of car games, uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage as someone who has worked on a couple big ones, Mr. Lucas Litzinger. How's everybody doing today? Yeah? So uh, my name is Lucas Litzinger. I've been a game designer at Fantasy Flight Games for a long time. Uh, one of the first games I worked on uh, was actually Android Netrunner, and I removed dice from the game. So I felt like it was time to make penance for that, and uh, the most recent game I've worked on has been a really cool combination of cards and dice, and that is Star Wars Destiny. I don't know if anybody's heard of this game. No? Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> But uh, this has really, I know it's a cliche, it's really been a dream come true for me to work on this game and to see the passion that I put into it, that Corey put into it, that everybody at the studio and at Admode has put into making this game a reality, it's been incredible. Because like the production of the dice is by itself, like I could probably talk about that for an hour, like the things that we're doing to make sure that you get these beautiful large art dice in your game that really evoke the cool Star Wars characters is, is impressive. Um, but, but as far as the game is concerned, uh, we have really, really exciting things in the works. We released two sets already, and we're about to release our third set, Empire of War, and that is going to come out very, very, very soon. So be patient a little bit longer. I know a lot of people are like, oh, can I buy it, can I buy it? And like, uh, someone actually like took a picture of the booster and like posted on the Facebook, like, hey, look, I'm so lucky I got my copy. And people are like, mm, nope. <laughs> and so uh, you can't buy it at the convention here, but you will be able to buy it very, very soon. And one of the great things that we're doing with Empire of War is introducing Star Wars Rebels characters. So Star Wars Rebels is a TV series, and it's really incredible. They're about to come out with season four. And so what better time to start releasing some of the Spectre crew and their adversaries than in this set. And so you'll get every member of the Spectre crew except one, which we're saving for later. Uh, and you'll also see characters like Thrawn and the Seventh Sister in the set as well. And so in addition to that, uh, you'll also uh, see Ahsoka Tano. Um, and 
hopefully you can kind of read that because I don't think the card has been spoiled. So that'll be fun for everybody to bring up their spectacles and try to try to see what she actually does. I can just tell you. <laughs> After you activate her for the first time each round, you can pay resources equal to the dice that you rolled uh, to ready her. So you can potentially use her more than mm -hmm. once per round. And this this is a really powerful ability if anybody's played the game. You can really it's one pretty, one. So pretty super strong. excited about her. I actually uh, put together a deck list that I think we're going to post next week uh, just to kind of show some of the fun tricks that you can do with her. So check out our website for that. One of the other things that we wanted to do with Empire War, uh, which is really exciting, is boost support cards. And we actually designed and developed the first two sets of the game before we released any product whatsoever. And so the game came out, and it's like we already had Spirit of Rebellion in the bag, and we were actually you know, mostly finished on Empire War. But we were able to do some things based on kind of how that meta was developing and make some adjustments to it. And one of those things is that we felt like we wanted to push support cards more. We wanted to have you play really cool vehicles and get them onto the table at top tier, uh, the tournament level. And so you will see really powerful support cards. Uh, you'll see basically events and uh, characters that interact with supports in fun ways. And so not only will new supports be seen in your decks, but you'll also be able to play a lot of old supports as well that maybe haven't seen as much play right now. And so this is, you can even see like we have a, a four resource cost on a house too, which sounds ridiculous. So in case you can't see, it's a two resource cost to trigger that. Uh, but we're also beginning to explore some of the other things that we can do with the various dice in the game. And I mean, I am so excited for this product. It's, it's really amazing. And uh, as I said, you'll be able to buy it soon, can't buy it here. And it's, it's been awesome to just see the response that Destiny has had. And if you haven't tried it, we do have demos, so you can go and try it. We have our tournament tomorrow. We have a really cool uh, Halt Kirk Vader promo that we're giving out there. And so uh, give it a go, and may the force be with you. Thanks. And uh, 
we've been really happy with, with how the designs are going, and we're you know continuing to push forward new stuff. Like I think at uh, at the booth, you've seen our case, uh, you've seen the announcement on our website. There's an awesome book uh, coming out that's an era source book for the for the rebellion. Uh, I think it's what is it? Is it Dawn of Rebellion? Dawn of Rebellion. Uh, that book is is really really cool. So like it's 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 interesting in that it doesn't fit into any of our existing uh, role playing lines, but it is uh, applicable to all of them. And uh, if you get a chance to check it out, I think that, that no no role playing book that we've done thus far has generated as much excitement internally as that book. It's got a lot of really awesome NPCs and other great things stated out that you're really gonna love. Uh, so, speaking of uh, generating excitement, uh, we recently announced the uh, 30th anniversary edition of the West End, uh, West End Star Wars role playing game. Yep. And uh, here to talk about that a little bit is Pablo Hidalgo from Lucasfilm. <laughs> Good day. So, um, as we've talked about, it's a year of anniversaries. We've got Gen Con 50, Fantasy Flight 20, Star Wars 40 years, but uh, an important milestone is 30 years of Star Wars role playing. And um, it's a better, how, how better to commemorate it than to bring back the books that started it all? Uh, this is a very uh, a project that's very near and dear to my heart because that's how I got my professional start in Star Wars. So don't ever let anyone tell you that uh, playing role playing games doesn't mean anything. Because um, <laughs> it went from being a teenager playing this game in Canada to now being part of the creative development team helping figure out where Star Wars is going in the future in film, television, and everywhere. So it's super exciting. So let me just rewind back to 1987. It's something that people who didn't live it can't really fathom the idea that Star Wars was not around. Um, we're living in a world now where there seems to be a major Star Wars news story every week. But back in 87, the Marvel Comics series had ended. You couldn't buy Star Wars toys with Lily. And uh, Ewoks and droids had even gone off the air. So you had nothing. You had basically a uh, 3D comic that was published in quarterly. Mm -hmm. And this, the Star Wars role playing game. So uh, it started off with two books, the original uh, role playing game, First Edition Rules, and the Star Wars source book. And it was these books that really started defining what the Star Wars universe was. It started giving labels and descriptions to things that had only lurked in the background of the original three movies. And they were so important, and they got so much right that there are so many things in these books that continue to be relevant today. Uh, a Twilight wouldn't be a Twilight were it not for these books. Uh, a Hammerhead Alien would only be a Hammerhead Alien and not a Jordan if not for these books. And even if you don't intend to play this, although I recommend that you do, even if you don't intend to play this, they're great reads. West End Games did such a great job at presentation back in the 80s and 90s, but also you can tell that the writers were really passionate about the subject matter. Uh, so much so that when Star Wars started this new uh, phase of its existence in 2012 as we start looking forward to a future of new film and television. Uh, one of the things I was tasked to do was develop a writer's Bible for uh, new coming, uh, for, for new writers coming aboard the Star Wars experience. And I pulled a lot of material from the Designing Adventures chapter in the very first edition of Open Game because it got so much right. So uh, even if you do have copies, don't worry, their eBay value is now still Still relevant because there's some modifications to this book. It's heavily branded as a big anniversary product, but um, it is a genuine, authentic representation of what the game was. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Tomorrow, myself and some other colleagues uh, who have worked on basically every iteration of the role playing game are going to be doing a panel that is a retrospective of 30 years of Star Wars role playing and my particular component is going to be talking about how it continues to influence the story that we're doing at Lucasfilm. So I hope you can make that uh, panel tomorrow. Thank you very much, and uh, may the be with you. We're almost done. We're almost done. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll do a Q&A after. I forgot to mention that at the top, so we'll have time to talk some more. All right, so, uh, so 
We've talked about a lot of products, a lot of product lines. Uh, obviously, we, we don't have time to talk about everything. That doesn't mean we don't love all of the products that we do, all the products, product lines that we support uh, as equally as humanly possible. Uh, so I'm gonna go through just a few of uh, things we're additional things we're excited about, but again, this isn't everything. Uh, so, Rise of the Empire is a new expansion for our Rebellion board game uh, designed by Corey. Uh, it introduces a lot of stuff from, uh, from Rogue One, uh, some new units and a uh, modified combat system, which is pretty sweet. Uh, and uh, last, year, last year we announced two huge products in the Arkham Horror, uh, in the Arkham Horror setting, both Arkham Horror, the card game, and Mansion Madness 2nd Edition. Uh, we've been blown away by the support uh, from the fans for both of those games. Um, it's really amazing how much everyone seems to be really loving them. Uh, so we're obviously going to continue to support those. Path of Carcosa, which is our new uh, deluxe box for Arkham Horror the Card Game, is on sale now. I don't know if that's, if we have any of those left. We might. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Streets of Arkham for Mansion Madness. Uh, Armada. I know a lot of, uh, there's, we have a lot of Armada fans uh, and uh, wondering what's coming. Uh, I can tell you that we are working on something big for Armada. 